This church educational system fireside by Elder Henry B. Irene was given at Brigham Young University on September 8, 1996. It gives me great pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Elder Henry B. Irene. He was sustained as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on April 1, 1995. Elder Irene has served as a general authority since he was called in April of 1985 as the first counselor in the presiding bishopric of the church. He was called to be a member of the First Quorum of the Seventy in October of 1992. Before his call as a general authority, he had served as a regional representative, as a member of the Sunday School General Board, as a bishop, as a member of three high councils, as a counselor in a district presidency, and as president of a district mission. Elder Irene was deputy commissioner of education for the church from 1977 to 1980 and then Commissioner of Education from 1980 to 1985. He became Commissioner again in 1992. He was President of Ricks College in Rexburg, Idaho from 1971 to 1977. And he was on the faculty at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University from 1962 to 1971. In 1963 and 1964, he was an Alfred P. Sloan Visiting Faculty Fellow at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He received a Bachelor of Science degree in Physics from the University of Utah and a Master of Business Administration and a Doctor of Mis Business Administration degree from Harvard University. A native of Princeton, New Jersey, Elder Irene was born on the 31st of May, 1933, to Henry and Mildred Benyon Irene. Elder Irene is married to the former Kathleen Johnson. They are the parents of four sons and two daughters. It's a great privilege and a pleasure for us to have Elder Henry B. Irene with us tonight. I'm grateful to be here <clears throat> with you this evening for all that's been said, for the prayer, and for the music. As you listen to the International Choir sing, I'm not sure where your mind was taken, but somehow I saw a summer day in Carthage and thought of the Prophet Joseph asking John Taylor to sing that song and thought of the Savior looking down on them with love and concern, knowing that the prophet was to be a martyr. Their singing in different languages made me think of the great differences there are now across the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, the prophet would be so pleased, is so pleased, to know that the gospel is now going to every nation and will go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. I know there's great differences among us. I wish I had the chance to visit with each of you. I pray, and that you will pray, I hope as well, that tonight I might be able to talk about not our differences, but what we share what we have in common. All of us can remember times in our lives when we felt a pull to be better than we were, to rise higher. The feeling may have come at about the same time we had the thought, there must be something better in life than this. Sadly, there are also times when we felt like giving up. And then the thought was something like this, Maybe this feeling of being miserable is what life is really like. Maybe I need to learn to live with it. It looks as if that's how everyone else feels. Those movies about feeling good and those people who look happy, they must have bought into an illusion. There was even a t-shirt made with a slogan on the front that I think said something like, life is hard and then it's over. And I remember the look on the man's face wearing it made it seem like he was living proof. <laughs> <clears throat> the 
but, that it, but everyone that I have come to know well, even the most discouraged and the most miserable, will tell you that sometime in their lives, maybe just once, they felt that upward pull, that thought that there just had to be something better and higher. The feeling that perhaps in some way you haven't yet discovered you are meant to be better comes from our Heavenly Father. The opposing thought that the upward pull is an illusion comes from the adversary who wants us all to be miserable as he is. Now, Heavenly Father does more than allow you to feel that upward pull. He has provided a way to rise higher, almost beyond our limits of imagination, not by our powers alone, which would not be nearly enough, but through the power of the atonement of His Son, Jesus Christ. His prophets have described that gift to us many ways, but this passage teaches both the idea and can give you that feeling again that there is a way to rise above where we are. I say unto you, if you have come to a knowledge of the goodness of God and His matchless power and His wisdom and His patience and His long-suffering towards the children of men and also the atonement which has been prepared from the foundation of the world that thereby salvation might come to him that should put his trust in the Lord and should be diligent in keeping his commandments and continue in the faith even unto the end of his life. I mean the life of the mortal body. I say that this is the man who receiveth salvation through the atonement which was prepared from the foundation of the world for all mankind whichever were since the fall of Adam or who are, who ever shall be, even unto the end of the world. That beautifully describes why you are justified in your hope of changing, of being lifted to a higher plane of living. In another place in the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord describes how we can choose to receive His gift and be lifted towards Him and our Father in Heaven. Here are the words which describe that process from the 76th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, starting with the 69th verse. These are they who are just men made perfect through Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, who wrought out this perfect atonement through the shedding of his own blood. Our Heavenly Father not only provided a Savior and a gospel of Jesus Christ, which teaches us the purposes of life, and gives us commandments, but he provided covenants we could make with him. And with those covenants, he provided ordinances where we could signify what we promised or covenanted to do. And he could signify what he promised or covenanted to do. All of those covenants taken together are a new and everlasting covenant. Our Heavenly Father has at different periods in the history of this earth adjusted what He asked of His children because of choices they made. But that the new and everlasting covenant has endured and will endure is described by the Lord this way in the first verse of the 22nd section of the Doctrine and Covenants as the gospel of Jesus Christ was being restored for the last time. Behold, I say unto you that all old covenants have I caused to be done away in this thing. And this is a new and an everlasting covenant, even that which was from the beginning. Heavenly Father has always helped His children by offering them covenants and empowering His servants to offer ordinances. President Mary G. Romney names some of those covenants as he describes the kindness of our Father in Heaven and of the Savior. Quote, Traditionally, God's people have been known as a covenant people. The gospel itself is the new and everlasting covenant. The posterity of Adam, of Abraham, through Isaac and Jacob is the covenant race. We come into the church by covenant, which we enter into when we go into the waters of baptism. The new and everlasting covenant of celestial marriage is the gate to exaltation in the celestial kingdom. Men receive the Melchizedek priesthood by an oath and covenant. 
My simple message to you tonight is one of gratitude to our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, for offering to make those covenants with us. And it is a message of joy that those covenants are what you have always wanted, are what you yearn for when you felt those stirrings for a better life. Now, my concern is that by looking only at the promises we make, the magnitude of them could overwhelm and perhaps even discourage us. Sadly, many of us have seen that happen. We've taught the gospel to someone who understood it, believed it, but shrank back at the thought of taking on the obligations that come with the ordinance and the covenants of baptism. It just takes issuing the baptismal challenge to a few contacts to have the experience of seeing concern in the eyes of even a believing contact. Perhaps that is why Alma the Elder issued his invitation to accept the obligations of the baptismal covenant in the beautiful way that he did. Listen, it is recorded this way, starting with the eighth verse of the 18th chapter of Mosiah. Try to picture yourself in that crowd. And it came to pass that he, that's Alma, said unto them, Behold, here are the waters of Mormon, for thus they were called. And now as you are desirous to come into the fold of God and to be called his people and are willing to bear one another's burdens that they may be light, yea, and are willing to mourn with those that mourn, yea, and comfort those that stand in need of comfort and to stand as witnesses of God at all times and in all things and in all places that you may be in even until death, that you may be redeemed of God and be numbered with those of the first resurrection, that ye may have eternal life. Now I say unto you, if this be the desire of your hearts, what of you against being baptized in the name of the Lord as a witness before him that she hath entered into a covenant with him, that she will serve him and keep his commandments, that he may pour out his spirit more abundantly upon you? Alma knew what it takes not only to be willing but to love, to make covenants with God. He didn't minimize the obligations, a lifetime of reaching out to every soul whom God may call us to serve, both with comfort and with fearless declaration of the truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ as God has revealed it to his authorized servants. The person contemplating such a life can sense that it will take effort and courage. Alma knew that they would see that, and so he also told them what we need to hear, too. Notice at the end, in only a few words, he told them what God would covenant to do as they kept their part of the covenant, quote, that he may pour out his spirit more abundantly upon you. The people he was inviting to the covenant of baptism had already tasted the sweet promptings of the Holy Ghost. Alma gave a promise that is sure if they would make and keep the covenant in the waters of baptism. They would then be able to receive the ordinance of the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost, and then they would not only have an increase in the power and frequency of those sweet promptings of the Comforter, but they could have the promise fulfilled to them of the Holy Ghost as a companion. With every covenant, there are great and sure promises from our Heavenly Father. Alma must have known that those people could anticipate and so had won a life where the Holy Ghost could be a companion. Oh, but he taught them more than that. Listen to the words again with which he began. Quote, as ye are desirous to come into the fold of God and to be called his people. Alma knew the covenant was not like a business deal. You do this for God and God will do this for you but it was an opportunity for them to become his, to become God's people. Every covenant with God is an opportunity to draw closer to him. To anyone who reflects for a moment on what they have already felt of the love of God, to have that bond made stronger and that relationship closer is an irresistible offer. Alma knew the people he taught had felt and recognized the love of God. 
We may not recognize it, but when our faith lets us see the evidence of God's love and his blessings, we will be as eager to make a covenant to draw closer to him as were the people at the waters of Mormon. That upward pull we have felt is far more than a desire for self-improvement. It is a longing for home to be again with the Heavenly Father we have loved and who loves us and to be able to live again with him, feeling the love we felt there and which we can taste here if we will. And all of us sense the mighty change that must come in us for us to be able to dwell with him. Now we find that same pattern of describing obligations, promises, and the assurance of growing closer to God in the way the Lord offers us other covenants. The Melchizedek priesthood is offered with an oath and covenant. You can hear words describing both promised blessings, the assurance of drawing closer to God to become more like him, as well as the solemn obligations we assume. We have it in these words, starting at the 33rd verse of the 84th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. Listen. For whoso is faithful unto the obtaining of these two priesthoods of which I have spoken, and the magnifying their calling, are sanctified by the Spirit under the renewing of their bodies. They become the sons of Moses and of, Ab of Aaron, and the seed of Abraham, and the church and kingdom and the elect of God. And also all they who receive this priesthood receive me, saith the Lord. For he that receiveth my servants receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth my Father, and he that receiveth my Father receiveth my Father's kingdom. Therefore all that my Father hath shall be given unto him. And this is according to the oath and covenant which belongeth to the priesthood. Therefore, all those who receive the priesthood receive this oath and covenant of my Father, which he cannot break, neither can it be moved. But whoso breaketh this covenant after he hath received it, and altogether turneth therefrom, shall not have forgiveness of sins in this world, nor in the world to come. And woe unto all those who come not unto this priesthood which ye have received, which I now confirm upon you, who are present this day by mine own voice out of the heavens. And even I have given the heavenly hosts and mine angels charge concerning you. The magnitude of the promises available through that covenant make the heart beat a little faster. Here are just a few. When we honor that priesthood, we have heavenly hosts and angels who are watching over us. Some of us know how literally that is true. There are some returned missionaries listening tonight who know that they have walked down streets and been in some places and faced some anger and opposition where they have felt protection and being watched over by more than human power. Some of us have an absolute assurance that those whom we have known, who held the priesthood, who are now part of the heavenly host after their death, are deeply aware of what we are doing and sometimes deeply concerned for the quality of our service. Then the promise is also there that those who receive the servants of God, honoring that priesthood, will have this blessing. For he that receiveth my servants receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth my Father, and he that receiveth my Father receiveth my Father's kingdom. Therefore all that my Father hath shall be given unto him. There again is the promise that is in all the covenants which God offers to us to make with him. Keeping them will draw us up closer to him. And even a small recognition of his love makes us want to make covenants with him and to keep them. That love more than wipes out the fear that the magnitude of our promises and the severity of the penalties for failure could create in us. The covenant God offers us in marriage contains the crowning promise, the one that most touches our hearts, to be sealed in the temples of God by the sealing power which God has restored to the earth allows God to promise us that we may have all that he has to live the life that he lives and to be with him, the Savior, and our faithful family members forever in perfect love and harmony. Our promise is a complete one, too. 
We promise to give him all that we have and are and all that we may ever have and ever achieve. So the promise is that we may have all he has by our giving all we have. The almost unimaginable imbalance of that exchange, all we have for all he has, is a measure of his love for us. That ought to increase the upward tug we felt in the way a prophet long ago described it in his heart. He felt it too. He said it this way in Alma, the 36th chapter, the 22nd verse. Yea, methought I saw, even as our father Lehi saw, God sitting upon his throne, surrounded with numberless concourses of angels in the attitude of singing and praising their God, yea, and my soul did long to be there. All of us are blessed by these covenants, whatever our circumstances. There were in the central part of Africa people who could not accept the baptismal covenant because those authorized to administer that ordinance were not yet among them. But they studied the scriptures of the Restoration as well as the Bible, learned all they could, lived what they understood, and waited. The opportunity to be baptized finally came. They had prepared. Each time I go to the temple to perform an ordinance by proxy for a dead ancestor, I pray that somehow the faithful elders in the spirit world have found them, that they have anticipated this day, and that their hearts they have been prepared to make and keep the covenants I offer them. The same is true for the oath and covenant of the priesthood and the covenant of marriage in the temple. There might be some young women listening tonight thinking this thought, what has this got to do with me? But then you may go out of this meeting tonight with friends whose lives could be changed forever by how you feel about the oath and covenant of the priesthood and the covenant of marriage in the house of the Lord. You may have more influence than you can imagine on a young man's keeping the oath and covenant of the priesthood and whether he will ever know the joy of making covenants in the temple. You may have more power than anyone else. If you love those commandments, he is more, those covenants, he is more likely to love and honor them. All of us need to increase our desire to make covenants with God. A place to begin is to recognize what has already happened to each of us. For instance, that stirring we have felt to be better, the thought there must be some higher life and better place is a gift of faith and covenants with God. We could ask tonight God in prayer to confirm that is true. And the feeling, the upward pull, that it came from him. Another recognition of what is past, which will increase our desire to keep covenants, is to see more clearly the evidence of God's love for us in what he has already done. That can be hard. The world tries to tell us that whatever good happens is from our own efforts. And then in a quick reversal of logic from the claim that there is no God to the suggestion that he is heartless, the world will say to us, how can you believe in a God of justice and mercy when such bad things happen to you and others? On top of the world trying to get us to believe God couldn't be the author of our blessings, our natural selfishness can distract us from recognizing and feeling his love. We can focus so much on what we have asked for that either he hasn't yet given or may never give because it is not good enough for us, that we ignore the blessings he has already showered upon us. King Benjamin wrote some words which might be our frequent reading if we would like to increase our desire to make covenants with God by sensing more clearly his love for us. You will remember it since it's familiar and you've heard it lots of times. But you might listen this time instead of for the rebuke which is there about ingratitude. Listen to it just as a description of your life. It's an invitation to see ourselves as children, favored, favored children of a loving father. I say unto you, my brethren, that if you should render all the thanks and praise which your whole soul has power to possess, to that God who has created you and has kept and preserved you and has caused that you should rejoice and has granted that you should live in peace one with another. I say unto you that if you should serve him who has created you from the beginning, 
and is preserving you from day to day by lending you breath, that you may live and move and do according to your own will and even supporting you from one moment to another. I say, if you should serve him all, with all your whole souls, yet ye would be unprofitable servants. And behold, all that he requires of you is to keep his commandments. And he has promised you that if you would keep his commandments, ye should prosper in the land. And he never doth vary from that which he hath said. Therefore, if ye do keep his commandments, he doth bless and prosper you. Now in the first place he hath created you and granted unto you your lives, for which ye are indebted unto him. And secondly, he doth require that ye should do as he hath commanded you, for which if ye do, he doth immediately bless you. And therefore he hath paid you. And ye are still indebted unto him, and are and will be forever and ever. Therefore, of what have ye to boast? And now I ask, can ye say aught of yourselves? I answer ye, nay, ye cannot say that ye are even as much as the dust of the earth. Yet ye were created of the dust of the earth, but behold, it belongeth to him who created you. And I, even I, whom ye call your king, am no better than ye yourselves are, for I am also of the dust. And ye behold that I am old, and am about to yield up this mortal frame to its mother earth. Now you and I could choose to see Heavenly Father in our lives that way. Even as his mortal body was failing, King Benjamin saw that every covenant he had kept had brought the promised blessings. But on top of that, he had received the blessings God pours out on all his children without regard to their station or even their gratitude. If we could just train ourselves to see as King Benjamin saw, it wouldn't be hard to keep what the Savior described once as the first commandment. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. We can start down the road of King Benjamin tonight by counting our blessings. We could try naming them one by one in prayer tonight, perhaps pausing a moment after each one to let the feelings of gratitude grow. We may not only be surprised by what the Lord has done, but by how long we have been kneeling there as the blessings we have not noticed or forgotten come flooding into our minds. The covenant, covenant promise the Lord made that his disciples would remember his words extends to remembering and recognizing his blessings. I know because I have tried it. Here is the promise as recorded in John. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. That feeling of gratitude and love which will come from that prayer will move us towards wanting to make and keep covenants with God. Those who are not yet members of the church will be drawn to pray to ask whether the power to baptize was restored through John the Baptist conferring the Aaronic priesthood upon Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, and whether the power to confer the gift of the Holy Ghost was returned to the earth by Peter, James, and John. Those of us who have already been baptized will review our lives to see what we have done or not done that determines whether the Lord can keep his promise to let the Spirit always be with us. Because we are human still, that reflection usually leads to a desire to repent of things both done and not done. If we repeat the process often enough and with enough intent, we will feel some desires to honor the oath and covenant of the priesthood. That oath and covenant has blessings in it for all of us, young and old, whatever our situations. You remember the promise. For he that receiveth my servants receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth my Father, and he that receiveth my Father receiveth my Father's kingdom. Therefore, all that my Father hath shall be given unto him. There is a blessing for us in such a small act as inviting a home teacher to give a blessing or asking a bishop if there is any way we could help him in his service. There is a blessing in the way we speak of the prophet of God and in whether we listen when he speaks we can receive the Lord's servants in a week or two simply by whether for us there is a yearning to hear their words or to read them and ponder when we can. When we receive the Lord's servants, we receive him in that we are all blessed 
or we can be by the promises and the oath and covenant of the priesthood. Within the family, there may, for us, be even greater opportunities to welcome the powers promised through the priesthood and thus welcome the Lord. Every person in a family has an effect on the power of the priesthood exercised there. For a solitary member, it may be to ask for a home teacher to give a priesthood blessing. For the child of a father growing indifferent to his priesthood covenants, it may be the quiet request, Dad, I'd like you to be with me when I go to the temple, or, or Dad, it would mean so much to me if you could set me apart. More than one man has started upward again, never to turn back after hearing and feeling such a plea from his child. The covenant of a temple marriage may seem distant, either because it appears unattainable or because the cares of a busy life have eroded the meeting it had when the covenants were made. But every child of God is promised every blessing if they are faithful. And where those covenants were made, the blessings are still available. In just the last few days, I heard a young girl report a night of babysitting. That doesn't sound very celestial, and it had its challenges for her. But the reports of the little kindnesses shown, of her patience, of long-suffering, made me think of a passage of Scripture that may not have occurred to her that night at all. You remember it goes this way. No power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood, only by persuasion, by long-suffering, by gentleness and meekness, and by love unfeigned. She may not have been thinking of marriage. Probably wasn't. She's so young. Nor of the home she may someday have, or of children, or of a priesthood holder in it as her companion. But she was choosing that night in just her simple service to live in such a way that if someday God gave her such blessings, those children and that husband would experience and expect the kind of care that is given by the true servants of God simply by her example. If she were so blessed, her husband would be drawn upward in his priesthood service just by what that little girl grown older would bring to that home and that family. We can all do things that will lead us to love, make, and keep covenants, and we can, without invading their agency, invite others by example to love and want to make and keep covenants. They can do that because of what we do, looking forward to the peace and the hope that can come from keeping the baptismal covenant, from receiving those who honor the oath and covenant of the priesthood, and from associating in a home where people are living so that they might be sealed to live forever in the presence of our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, I want to tell you what I know. I have not talked to you about theory. I've talked to you about what I know. I know that our Heavenly Father lives. I have felt His love. I have felt his patient and enduring love all of my life. I know that Jesus is the Christ, that he lives, that through his sacrifice and love, we are cleansed and sanctified as we obey the laws of the gospel. I have felt that cleansing. I have felt the power of that atonement in my own life. I have seen it in the lives of those I love. I know that Jesus is the Christ. I know that the ordinances and covenants offered through the keys of the priesthood held by President Gordon B. Hinckley, Hinckley are honored by God when we honor them. I promise you that the promises are true. I pray that you will accept them in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This church educational system fireside by Elder Henry B. Eyring was given at Brigham Young University on September 8, 1996.